Hello, this is Adrian Shepard from Springtime of Nations. With me is our fearless advocate, Lap Leong Gyeong. Lap Gong Leong. I did that last time, too. Okay, that, works. Okay. <laughs> we'll keep that in. Uh, <laughs> sorry, Lap. Man, I really need to get better at that. That's okay. Well, uh, I'm excited to have this discussion because it is about a very, uh, I think, controversial but important topic, and that is the connection between two different political projects, one in the United States and one in the continent of Africa. One, of course, is the much beloved Free State Project uh, centered in New Hampshire. This is a political project by libertarians to create a libertarian state and society. And the other, Lep, why don't you introduce the other? And the other one is something similar, but more th more than a bit controversial and quite ter uh, um, and quite uh, quite um, emotive. It's called Arania, and Arania is related to many other concepts. But the one concept that Arania tries to fulfill is the Volkstadt or the people's state. Right, and uh, why don't you tell us what the Volkstadt is? Well, there, for so this video will not be an in-depth explanation about Volkstadism or uh, or the Afrikaner Volkstadt or Afrikaner self-determination. There are many other videos that cover that in greater detail. And before I say anything, I want to say that the videos that are the videos and the articles that I best learned this from are online. They're heavily available. The um, I, I don't want to butcher his name, but 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 there's a man in the inter on the internet called Ernest Van Ziel. No, sorry, Ernst Van Ziel. Ernst Van Ziel is a lawyer and a cam a campaign officer for strategy and content at a place called Afri Forum. Afri Forum is a organization that seeks to advocate Afrikaner interests and. Um, he has a lot of articles on this. He has his own channel called Conscious Karakal, where he speaks to the leader of Irania, Eust Stridum. But, and I will I will send a link to those videos where you could learn more about Irania and Irania there. But in short, the whole concept of Irania is own self self in practice or self work or self reliance. And many people in Irania are simply are are simply people who want to live in in a in an Afrikaner only community. There are other Afrikaner only communities out there. Most notably, there's one called Kleinfontein in near Pretoria, and Pretoria does hold special significance in Afrikaner circles. Uh, Pretoria has one of the highest, in raw numbers and by percentage. A lot of white people, especially Afrikaners, live in Pretoria. And most white people in South Africa live either on the Western Cape or in Gauteng, Gauteng being the small province that holds Johannesburg and Pretoria. And many of them, I think two thirds of white people in, uh, in South Africa are Afrikaners. The British South Africans have either emigrated or don't play as much large of a role in politics as they used to, even though very, it was only until very recently that they were they, they were the economically predominant group in South Africa. OK, so what is Arania? Arania is a town in the Northern Cape in the middle of the Karoo Desert, which only how which is a piece of private property that only allows afrikaners to live there it is not a white ethno state and as i was trying to write an, another video for springtime of nations i was trying to write a video about white white ethno statism and whatnot but it would be it would be slanderous and inaccurate for me to call irania a white ethno state that's what it's uh, that's what what it's known for. But the Afrikaners 
don't consider it a haven for white people. They consider it a, a, a home or a town just for their own selves. And what makes Arania and Kleinfontaine and other places so special is that Arania chiefly does not accept black labor. Many Afrikaners believe that, that they lost their independence and they went on, a dark, on the wrong path when they started rely on, relying on black labor. So even though the whites made up 20%, 19 to 20% of the population for a very long time, much of their economic activity depended on cheap black labor that they, that they could exploit. And that's how the economy got its, of South, Southern Africa got its start. You had white capital, white intellectual property, a lot of European links to the European British world. But because immigration to Southern Africa was, was not as, uh, say, uh, attractive as Australia, the population of the whites never really, never really numbered more than one fifth uh, at its highest in 1910. And for every census up until the modern day, whites made up a very consistent fraction of 19%, but they could never really grow it beyond that. There was no, there was no case where, there, where millions of white people, white people could immigrate into South Africa and turn it 40% white or 50% white. That's, that was never going to happen. So, well, you have this population that lives very well, but a lot, of their, a lot of the lives that they lead are dependent on black labor. So black people work the mines, black people work the factory jobs, black people would do the uh, housework, black people would effectively be an underclass or work menial jobs. Right, and don't, and don't forget the uh, farm labor, of course, too. Yes. So, you know, it's actually, it's funny, uh, the way you're framing it, or the way uh, the, the Iranians frame it, it it has a kind of callback to old classical Zionism, this idea that the Jewish uh, race had kind of uh, decayed in its, its moral and economic power because it was kind of cloistered as a urban capital-owning class that could, did not own actually any uh, ability to create for itself. Well, uh, I think there is a chief difference. I mean, there is. I guess you could call Carol Boshoff the Afrikaner Theodore Herzl, but I mean he's not, of course, because the fate of the Jews and the fate of the Afrikaans are I mean, very different. You the. The white Africans, the Dutch-speaking white Africans, clearly believe themselves to be to be part of the land. They they consider themselves a tribe that came from somewhere else. At least that's how they see themselves today. And remember that the African Afrikaners did not make up a very sorry from basically the start of. South Africa as a unified state, maybe even before, maybe even before that, to around the 1980s, the Afrikaners, at least economically, played second fiddle to the English-speaking South African whites. It was the British South Africans that had the large companies, that had the important stakes that in global capital, that, that basically formed the think tanks like the Brenthurst Foundation. You know, Oppenheimer was Jewish, but there were similar classes of, so of white South Africans who had that power, that economic dominance, and they were all British South Africans. Now, that was until the 1980s. Some people say, in my opinion, it was not in my opinion. Some people say that because of sanctions, a lot of foreign capital sold their assets at bargain, bargain rate prices to the uh, Afrikaners, although... Afrikaner wealth uh, uh, wealth generation was already sorry for sounding millennial. The the Afrikaners were were already developing themselves before the 1980s. Certainly by the time they took they took political power in 1948. Now, own self self is a reaction to the fact that 
in order for the white people to enjoy such a high standard of living. And I really mean this. When you talk to white people in South Africa, everybody seemingly had a really great upper middle class lifestyle on despite um, despite having a middle income a middle income economy. And you were talking about people with swimming pools, black servants, cooks, well, in order for that to happen, you need you need black people to remain a, to to at least take those jobs. And even though the status and the economic rise of black people was already happening, albeit at an anemic pace, Afrikaners began to realize that they lost, like the Zionists, they lost their independence because they depended on this black labor. So they began to adopt. So many Afrikaners who were willing to build the Volkstadt their own communities began to adopt the phrase own self self or self or self work. So basically what made Arania so special as to every, every other white topia that you see in the West is that the whites are doing their own labor. The whites are picking up after themselves. The whites are sweeping the roads. The whites are building the infrastructure. Arania is home to some skilled civil engineers that build that have built the infrastructure, that supply their own labor, blah, 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 blah. That is what makes it so unique. So I'm sure that most m people who watch this channel, Springtime of Nations, some of them are white. I think, I, I think maybe most, maybe a plurality or a majority are white. And a small fraction of those, of those people are probably from middle class or upper middle class communities. And everyone knows in America, at least when I see it, when I'm in this very, I'm in this very nice apartment building that my dad and I have lived in for a very long time. Always unfailing. There's black nannies, Asian nannies, Filipino nannies. You never see a lot of white au pairs. And that's because in America, the whites depend, and well, the wealthy in general, not just the whites, depend on cheap labor. So Irani, and I don't want to state this enough, I know I'm restating this, but Irania work, Irania's whole purpose before building the Volkstadt is to prove that Afrikaners can do their own work. Uh, Eust Stridum goes into a lot of detail about how hard it was for some people, especially wealthier Afrikan, Afrikaner people, to adjust to this new life. That before living among their own they had to they had to clean up after themselves they had to effectively give up a a very nice lifestyle that suited most people even today so that's one of them that's the first basis own self i don't know i don't know if i'm mangling the words but self ownership own work now upon that foundation comes up to self-determination and at the top is the Volkstadt. Self-determination of the Afrikaners is a very contentious part of the constitution. South African constitution is very long, very progressive. Uh, it's very hard to interpret in my opinion because there's a lot of competing clauses that can be interpreted one way or another. It could be interpreted in a black liberationist way. It could be interpreted in a self-determin, in a pro-self-determination um, way. It's very hard to know the intentions and the spirit of the law when there when there's just so much of it. So the the so whereas the United States Constitution is relatively clear, there's a lot of leeway. So there is habeas corpus, there's posse comitatus, all that kind of stuff in constitutional and American constitutional law. But a lot of it can be expanded or contracted as the years go by. When you have a very long constitution, in my, this is my opinion only, I'm not a legal academic. When you have a very long constitution that leaves very little room for ambiguity, it's very hard to know what the spirit of the law is uh, unless, well, it's very easy to know what the law says. It's very easy to know what the law does. It's very hard to know in what spirit you're supposed to, to interpret the law. Uh, so going back to what we should say, Afrikaner self-determination is legal. You can form an affinity community in South Africa because of a section called Section 235. And in 2003, Arania was declared legal by the S South African Supreme Court. Whether that means there could be millions of Aranias or 40 of them or whatnot, 
Afrikaner anchor towns, as they call them, is it, it's in my mind, Arania is legal, and that should mean that Afrikaner towns like it should be legal. But it's uh, it's 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 a murky it's a murky. Um, I have a, I have a question um, yes. regarding that uh, article. Has any other community, say uh, African tribes, uh, used that uh, kind of legislation to their advantage to create affinity know. communities? I don't really know. I'm going to have to ask you, Stridem, and it's probably better to our viewers watch those. Um, to be honest, those documentaries are better than what I could say. But I do think that Afri Forum does work with people such as the Zulu to increase their autonomy. I don't know if there's a Zulu Arania, but because they're more numerous in, say, KwaZulu Natal. And um, the fact is that I think there are some black tribes or black affinity communities that will that have been set up. It's just a matter of um, it's just a matter of uh, feasibility. So I, I don't. I'm sorry for not answering that question very well. Well, we've talked enough ar about Arania. So basically, once the this is my interpretation of it. You have a pyramid. It the first the first thing to do is to live on your own work, to be proud of your own labor not to depend on outsiders or others, which is not a very, it's not very liberal, but that's circumstances of history. Then you have self-determination as you work up, as you build your own independent communities, you then gain the strength to determine your own self, your own community's constitutional status. Then hopefully in say the next 50 years or so, maybe a lifetime, there will be the Volkstadt or the Afrikaner Volkstadt, which, it's very hard to make because we because nobody can really agree what the territory of this Volkstadt is. Most people who speak Afrikaans live in the Cape, not in the Cape, no, in the western part of the country, the northern Cape, the eastern Cape, the um, the western Cape around there. That's that's where around where most of the people who speak Afrikaans live, not always white, of course, but that's where Afrikaans speaking is very common, even among the, the, the mixed race population. Um, some people say that it, it's a little bit in the Karoo desert. I mean, it's very hard as there's no hard territory. Uh, but, uh, but that's the goal. The goal is that you, you live on your own labor, you gain the strength to find independence, and then there will be the Volkstadt. So I guess in that way, it's more successful than the free state project. Now, both of us are libertarians. I'm still a libertarian. And both of us would like to see the northern, the, sorry, the free state project succeed in such a way. The Free State Project is also very similar. Um, some libertarian think, think tank guy, I think his name was Jason Sorens, who works for Mercatus, one day proposed that there should be 20,000 libertarians who move to New Hampshire, thereby creating or at least influencing libertarian politics in New Hampshire and creating one day the libertarian state. I've never been to New Hampshire. I ought to go. I used to be a New Englander, but let, let's face it, the, 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 the Free State Project has not benefited from the same amount of planning or diligence needed to make such a success. I suppose that the libertarians that do live in New Hampshire do tend, tend to be a bit more organized and they've done a good job influencing the state Republican Party. And the Republican Party in New Hampshire arguably is more successful than it's ever been. And it's very strange because despite voting Democratic all the time, New Hampshire is spiritually quite a Republican country, uh, Republican state. And New Hampshire does rank very highly on the uh, Freedom in the 50 States Index, although for a while it was surpassed by Florida, believe it or not. Yes, yeah. although I think a lot of it had to do with... Uh... Florida's better COVID policies in the years that that uh, occurred. Yes, and the fact that Florida 
Florida is more of a conservative than a libertarian state, but but true to the, true to their uh, shrewdness, the conservatives have known how to attract many people that were like minded and to basically remake it in their own image. So, I guess that's one of our L's. In okay, I get. I guess we, we have- well uh, that actually that I think you you kind of touched on something very interesting that the idea that Florida could maybe. Be- be considered a conservative free state project. I mean, so can Texas, but well, so in some ways, yes. Although I, I would say, Florida, I think Florida, you, Florida you, would, you would, there, you would, there's been long campaign since 1998 to reshape the state, and it, it, it it's, it's succeeded. Right. I, I think you might even make the claim that for Texas. I, the, the the quote unquote Texas uh, project to keep or make it conservative is much more of kind of like a fighting retreat, whereas Florida is is uh, is a successful advance into becoming more and more consolidated. I mean that's really the problem with American conservatism and American libertarianism in general. We have this conflict. And the conflict is, do we either take back the entirety of the United States or do we consolidate in four or five states? And, you know, what we can learn from the Afrikaners is that you need a sense of of direction. And in the last 20, 25, 35, as long as I've been alive, I'm 26 years old. I have never seen conservatives win a culture war. We've lost on gay marriage. We've lost on abortion, even though we've been very good at influencing the judiciary. We've lost on economics with with Biden and Trump embracing this um, wholesale garbage bullshit around Oh, let's add a lot of sugar to the economy and then we'll get a high. I mean, there. yes, Texas is a beating retreat, even though foundationally the, foundationally the Texas Republican Party has far more power, far more, or did, far more control, far more opportunities because Texas has the infrastructure to secede. They have their own military for, for fuck's sakes. 15 to 20 percent of the Hispanic population considers themselves Hispanic white. So we have the people, we have the infrastructure, we have the political noose. For some reason, Texas is still moving left, even though you this is what really bothers me about about the Free State Project and Florida and Texas, and when conservatives have tried to build, I'm, I'm sorry that we've now, we've now gone way off topic, but this is what, what pisses me off. We ha- when you look at the fate of conservatism in the United States, we're, we're, we have far more financial, legal, institutional firepower, and yet for some reason our best minds are always complaining in their own dinner party circles and our own chat groups about how the liberals own everything. We have control of some very good real estate. Why don't we exercise that control? We are at, I mean, and to see these 2,500, 3,500 white South Africans in the middle of nowhere have bravery, gumption, integrity to build their own communities, even though they don't even have a tenth of the financial firepower or institutional um, infrastructure, to see them make a difference in the world and to see us flail and bitch and moan, even though we have far more than them, I mean, it's, it's demoralizing. American conservatives have a lot of money. American libertarians have a lot of money. We have talent. We have numbers. We have everything we've got to secede. And yet we can't even decide whether we want to take back the entire country or build our own redoubts. It's this confusion between ends and means. So even though... I I don't know what made me so interested in a bunch of strange-sounding white people in in the course of my life. First, it was French Canadians, the Scots, the English, the British as a whole, the French. I mean, every time I, I, every time I look at other countries, they struggle more than us. They have all these challenges, but they are fighters. They're happy warriors. They have a, a, 
they have a dignity and a diligence and an integrity. And we're still on here fucking fucking talking about the woke left, the woke this, the woke shit, blah, blah, blah. I mean, it's, you know, personally, if any other of our analog peoples had had a tenth of the power and the money and the and the organi organizing power that we do they probably have made their volkstadt years ago they probably the western cape would have seceded 5 years ago 10 years ago rather than now and to see the and to see the people to see my south african friends to see my british friends to see my other friends have a a, a composure that we don't have is very, 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 it's maddening because we can do this. I want, I want everyone who's watching this, every goddamn, I know I, every person that's watching this, I want you to study the example of the Western Cape, of Arania, of, of Afrikaner Volkstadism, of, to, to look, to, to, to at least tweet at used stridum. We, it's, it's very hard to see these people who have struggled and yet still have still still persevere and to see us us in america well, you know to see us in america effectively give in to our own self indulgence i have given in to my own self indulgence if i were braver i'd probably move to fucking miami or austin because we have achieved so much as a movement Maybe not in our individual selves, such as the libertarian movement or the conservative movement or the anti-woke movement, but together as an anti-left movement, as a pro, as a pro-liberty movement, we've achieved so much. We have a lot to our name, but we are afraid to take the final step. And the final step is our people's state. Of course, there are going to be a lot of arguments because, let's face it, a majority of the anti-left movement in America is, is non-Hispanic white. So the big argument is what is the role of Asians and blacks, the, very, the, the small numbers of Asians and blacks and Latinos in this movement? There will be another question. Do we have secession or do we have autonomy? Do we go for Quebec and Scotland or do we actually go for independence? That's another question we will have to resolve. But the big, but, but, and I'm very sorry that I've, we've hijacked this, uh, we've hijacked, we were supposed to talk about the free state movement, but, but this is my, this is my video. This is my call out to our fellow freedom lovers, our freedom fighters. We have a lot of debates that we must settle, but are we willing to take the final step? The final step of accruing all of this power and wealth and infrastructure, we have more of it than we can ever imagine. But what worth? What is it worth all the money in the world and all the power in the world and all the political dominance in the world if we're so chicken shit as to actually create the society we want? The American nation, not the United States. The United States is not is no longer worth even praising because it, it has become so muddled and confused it cannot even understand the roots of its own discontent but the american nation that is something we can save but for us to save it we need to go beyond the accumulation of power and wealth and success and prestige i mean texas has a lot of that florida has a lot of that um, oh, so many states, there are so many exemplary red states. Now we have to take, now we must ask ourselves the final question. And I see we're nearly at an hour. I'm very sorry for being so disorganized, Adrian, but I want everyone to, to, to ask themselves, everybody who's watching this podcast, every libertarian, every Whig Nat, every conservative, every black nationalist, we must ask this of ourselves. Can we save our own nations from the government that is known as the United States? Can we save American identity, 
or must it be absorbed into this rainbow wannabe rainbow nationalism of United States Zionism? That is something we must ask ourselves because the S question is very hard. I do not pretend that Texas or Florida or New York City or whatever could magically spurn off a federal rule because the United States is a very powerful economic unit. So as is Britain, at least domestically, or France. But can we, can we at least build autonomy? That we at least divest some powers of the federal government to build the societies we want to live in? And until we can answer that question, a lot of us are just running in circles. The Afrikaners have answered their own question. They believe that the past was a mistake. They believe that they became too, too reliant on black labor. They believe maybe they have not repented for, from, from apartheid as they should, but they are now to sell, engage in a process of self-determination. So I'm going to, and I'm very sorry that we didn't talk about uh, the free state project, but I mean, come on, what is there to talk about now? given that the best libertarian governor we can hope for in that state is is is, is part of the Sununu family. But that is the question. Do we want to create an autonomous community? Do we want to create our own homeland for Americans of all races and none? Until we can answer that question, I've basically wasted all of your time. And no, I think I think you're downplaying uh, what you've done here, which is every every libertarian and their grandma knows enough about the Free State Project. What they don't know is examples of it actually succeeding. And well, I wouldn't I, call Ronnie a success just yet. I mean, I would call it a success in the making because there's a there are too many pitfalls in the continent of Africa that could really lead Arania to just pissing off so many people that eventually they they will not allow an affinity community even though it's in the constitution but when i look at pictures of irania when i when i talk to iranians when i see what they're building they're doing a braver job than any of us here in america can think of or or any of us in in the western world and um i'm sorry go go on well, I just, I just think, uh, yeah, the the pertinent stuff you've covered. Uh, I don't be distressed that uh, we've quote unquote gotten off topic by talking what really are very analogous movements, not just in South Africa but in America. And I think what libertarians will often do is they will engage in theory that only involves their own personal and ideological brethren where we really should be looking for examples from as many places as possible. And Listen, um, listen. American libertarianism and, and increasingly American conservatism and American right-wing people or non the non-left in general, we're not doing what must be done. A lot of us are retreating into our own bubbles. A lot of us listen to the same podcast, talk to the same people, get angry on Twitter as demographic change and other status and others, the growth of the state continues. I mean, Jefferson himself was very, very prone to this. He probably would be a brooding, um, if, 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 there, if there is a Jefferson alive today, He's probably in his mom's basement or out working out rather than doing any libertarian uh, libertarian state creation. Um, but I, I go back, I'll talk about the Free State Project. What is so admirable is that it has created the community. There are a lot of strange motherfuckers that call themselves libertarian, who are libertarian, that love to go up to New Hampshire, but probably can't live there for many reasons. Case in point, there really is no major city in, um, in New Hampshire that could provide the economic impetus for a lot of non-lefties like ourselves to center around. But that doesn't stop a place like Vermont, which is basically the leftist white ethno state of America, that 
at 91 percent white where they they live a very enchanted life and they're influencing politics on a level that we're not here in in, in our states i mean i don't think there has been a uh, a a, a right wing bernie sanders or a right wing barack obama um which is very sad given how much resources the right had the non-left has in america i'll send you the links perfect okay uh i'll let you get back to what you need to do uh you have a great day uh our friend lap was called away on some urgent business but i think we got what we wanted out of this conversation orania intentional communities in general need to be researched if libertarians are going to take this kind of project seriously and we should not shy away from the controversial aspects of Arania if we truly want to learn about the subject. And I hope that libertarians in the Free State Project and supporting the Free State Project do take these kinds of things seriously and do understand that we can learn lessons from analogous organizations. So on behalf of LAP, I'd like to thank you all for listening. Yeah, just just send me the links uh, when you have the time, have the and time. Uh, uh, when I get the video together, I'll just put it all in the description. Well, thank you, Adrian. This has been a great springtime of nations. May a thousand flowers bloom. Perfect. Thanks, buddy. Thanks, man.